afternoon, I'd like to call the Pitt County Planning Board in session. Um, and at this time, I would like to uh, call on our new clerk of the board, uh, Tabitha Alton. Yes, sir. Tab, better known as Tab, we refer to her as Tab. Tab comes to us, uh, used to work with uh, the Office of Emergency Services, and we're very glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if this time you would call the roll, please. Faye Barefoot. Here. Frank Branham. Here. Jacob Cox. Here. Lynn Evans. Here. Lyman Hardy. Here. Wanda Harrington. Here. Ke Taylor Keith. Here. William Wooten. Here. And Mr. Chairman, we received notice from Mr. Clay, Clay McGloy, is that correct? Yes. That he will not be in attendance tonight. <clears throat> and also, Mr. Thomas Harris has a scheduling conflict and he may not be in attendance. Okay. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum. At this time, I'd like to call on uh, member Taylor Keefe to do the, our prayer and Pledge of Allegiance. We'll all stand. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this wonderful county and the great people who live here. Thank you for this country and for the men and women who serve our military to defend our rights and our freedom. Lord, give this board the wisdom to make wise recommendations and decisions that would honor you. In your son Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Go lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Taylor. <clears throat> we have the minutes for the July 18th meeting. Um, and you have received those. Move to be approved. I have a second. motion. I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 They are approved. Thank you very much. The first item on the agenda uh, is regarding the subdivision maintenance questions. James? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to give a brief preview. I know a few of the members weren't here at our last meeting when we first uh, discussed this item, so I wanted to give you a preview of some of the information we've collected to date. And of course, also we have one of our major stakeholders tonight on this issue of street maintenance. Uh, that would be Mr. Woody Jarvis, who's the district engineer here in Pitt County and also covers Beaufort County. But uh, He'll be coming up a little bit later. He also has Gene Pittman from his office to talk more specifically about the process by which the Department of Transportation goes through to accept maintenance of these roads in subdivisions that are proposed for public acceptance. So uh, he'll be coming over in a few minutes just to, uh, coming up in a few minutes just to discuss those items and any questions you might have. Uh, again, just to refresh you, um, our subdivision ordinance, of course, is laid out to state that um, any roads that are built for proposed public maintenance, and again, there are options here. Developers can choose to establish a homeowners association for privately maintained roads. That's one category of streets. What we're specifically talking about are proposed public streets, and those are to be maintained ultimately by DOT. What our ordinance also states, and as we've talked further with our legal staff, and uh, Janice Gallagher is here, our county attorney tonight, and she may want to explain a little bit or expound a little bit more on this, but what she has indicated, there have been some issues with the language in our ordinance. It may not be explicit enough to actually spell out what the standards are for what's considered acceptable maintenance levels for the streets. And also, are there other issues that we need to explicitly spell out as far as how we go about that enforcement mechanism at some point? So we'll get to that a little bit later with some of the staff recommendations. Um, there is a petition process, and as I mentioned, uh, as we move forward with this, we'll also uh, get word from Woody and Gene about some of the uh, aspects of that. Bringing information forward to uh, the board, we also, from the staff level, have conducted a street assessment um, 
And what we've seen now, and not surprisingly, some of these older subdivisions, um, some of the roads are falling in disrepair. What we found out through this assessment, there are about 35 miles of proposed public streets out in our county. And what we've done with this assessment is kind of try to categorize these roads in three different um, categories. And you can see just some of the examples with the potholes and all. And what we've done, we've got those that are good, fair, or poor. And we've also taken an inventory and an assessment of these roads and all have pictures shown of some of the issues um, that were detected when we did the assessment. And just an idea, these are some newer roads and those that are in good condition. Fair condition, you can see some of the cracks in the road, some problems with some of the uh, pavement breaking off on the corner of the edge of the road pavement. And of course, where there are some that you can see have fallen in total disrepair, they might either be big potholes, some of which have been filled with materials that probably aren't acceptable to DOT standards, and then there are some that haven't been necessarily filled. And bottom line here, of those 35 miles of street, we've categorized in our terms about three miles of those roads are in poor condition. And I will tell you, and I'm sure Woody will speak to this, these poor condition roads are going to mean they need to be brought up to an acceptable standard. And basically, that means a lot of money needs to be poured into these roads to ensure that they meet the state standards. Uh, fair condition roads, about um, a third of the overall mileage, about 12 and a half miles. Uh, and again, these may need some fairly substantial work before they're taken over by DOT. And I guess a little bit of good news, more than half are still in what we categorize as new or good condition. And, um, but again, there are certain requirements that Woody and Gene will speak to that these roads have to meet, the development sites have to meet before DOT will even consider them. And one specifically is density requirements. Roads might be sitting out there in good shape right now, but the level of density of homes in that development may not meet the threshold that DOT requires, so they're not even eligible yet for DOT maintenance. So with that, I wanted to give Woody a, an opportunity to come up, speak more about the maintenance process, some of the issues he sees when these petitions float through his office. And um, planning staff will come back up after that to offer some recommendations and probably some next steps as we move along and explore in this issue. Any questions before I sit down? Any questions? Mr. Jarvis. Yes, sir. Good to have you. Thank you all for having us tonight. Uh, really glad to be here. And I can't go any further without thanking the planning board for having the caliber department that y'all have here in Pitt County. Working with James and his folks, they're the best partners we've got as far as trying to manage and help the public see a subdivision through fruition and see it finished and see it become a state road. Uh, your county ordinance uh, is definitely a model uh, across the state. Uh, we've got some mighty poor counties, we've got some very affluent counties, and uh, Pitt County is, is definitely in the upper crust of the folks that we work with in our highway work. A lot of demands come with that, but uh, there's also a lot of partnership and a lot of working together that goes on on a daily and a weekly basis between us. and between James and his folks, and I really want to thank him publicly and thank you publicly for uh, facilitating that with us. And uh, we are pretty much aware of most of the issues that you have with your subdivisions and your streets. Uh, this is a part of what we do as DOT. 
we've got a lot of hats, we've got a lot of irons in the fire, and we have a lot of people depending on us for a lot of different things. And when we think about development and we think about road additions and we think about subdivisions, um, if I had to categorize it in one word, it's money. There's a lot of money at stake when a piece of property is developed. Planning goes through many different phases from a piece of land starting as a farm normally here in the county to becoming a subdivision. It takes a lot of steps, it takes a lot of cooperation. We need uh, developers with vision. We have been blessed with a lot of that in the county. We've got uh, county officials with vision. We've been blessed over the years with a lot of that. And our DOT folks and our other government folks that help these things congeal and become a real working part of the community. It, it's, it, it takes everybody working together to see this done. And, and we have that here. Is it perfect? No. Is there ever enough money to do everything we'd like to do? No. Uh, I think the hardest thing we run into is we have to prioritize what we're going to do and try to prioritize our core functions and see that we do those first. And those core functions for us are relative to safety, relative to trying to make what we have work as conveniently and efficiently as possible and trying to make it environmentally sustainable so that we don't do a road project or get involved in a subdivision project that's going to damage our environment or hurt people. Uh, these are everyday things with us. We kind of tend to take them for granted. Uh, and in all of these processes, uh, we are in the road addition business. Uh, we are willing and ready and uh, able to add streets to the DOT road system. There is processes in place that walk us through that and uh, your subdivision ordinance is almost a mirror image of our procedures. We talk to developers, we develop an understanding on access needs, we look at how much traffic a subdivision is going to generate. Um, some interesting little things is when we think about a house in a subdivision, we kind of figure that that single family home will develop 10 trips a day on the road it's coming out to. And we try to plug that figure in and multiply it by the number of houses to get a feel for what that effect will be on the road it's next to. Uh, and we look at how to avoid having accidents with that additional traffic. How can we get these new homes serviced where they can get on and off this road without having accidents, without being rear-ended, without having side collisions, without pulling out and having a head-on collision? Uh, we're all impatient in our driving. We all are reluctant to take our feet off the gas and apply brakes and we all offend folks when we do things that cause them to have to slow down so all of these things come up in this process and uh, we get everybody in agreement a subdivision goes forward lots are sold everything's knocking along pretty good It's back to money. How's the economy going? How fast are the lots selling? Developer in general has a big investment because he's paved all these streets in this subdivision. If lots sell pretty quick, everything's pretty nice. If lots sell very slowly, then it becomes a long, drawn out <coughs> odyssey. I won't say problem, it just becomes a journey. But uh, what we're finding today is the economy has been fairly slow. Lots are selling fairly slow. 
when things were booming, we were building subdivisions and finishing and having them ready to turn over to DOT in five years or so. And a lot of what we're dealing with today are 10 and 15 year old subdivisions. Depending on the economy, they may be older than that when we get enough houses built in the subdivision to put them on the state system. And you may ask, well, why do you wait so long to take them? It's been our belief from a very common sense approach that the worst punishment on an asphalt street is when the houses are being built. And when we agree on construction specifications for subdivision, everything that we have says minimum standards. Well, if we're building a road on the minimum standards, because it's expensive to build a road, then we feel like it's a pretty fair requirement to hold the developer's feet to the fire to have the subdivision built before they come looking for the highway department to take it over. Because the concrete trucks and the lumber trucks and the traffic in and out during the construction period on these homes is probably the heaviest traffic aside from maybe a school bus or a moving van that the road will see. So it's a good test of the highway or the street and uh, that is one of the factors that <coughs> enters into this being a long and drawn out process. The next thing in, in this process uh, kind of a, I'm going to hit some of the high points and then I'm going to stop and let y'all ask questions, is this is a developer-driven process. You know, for the most part, the care of this subdivision belongs in the developer's hands until the lots are sold. So we're not in a mode where we go patrol new subdivisions waiting to see how many houses are there so that we can decide when we're going to put it on the system. We put the information out, we put the policy out, and we're kind of waiting to be contacted by the development community with their specific request to add a subdivision. Kind of makes sense. Uh, it is a process that works well, has worked well, we may have a few problems. We may have some things we need to address, but overall it's been a pretty successful way to handle road additions. Every road pretty much that we have, particularly on the secondary system, started usually some way. Uh, it'd be a very rare occasion for us to have, particularly in modern days, a road built on a new location now. We're approaching the point development-wise that there's not much territory left to go blaze a new corridor in. We've probably seen as much of that as we're going to see. So we'll be doing a lot of recycling, adding, moving, changing. Uh, there's going to be some pain associated with that. Uh, that's where planning boards and that's where staff really becomes valuable to trying to pick the best way to shepherd this growth and be stewards of the public trust in this. Um, kind of next, after you think about the process and it being developer driven, is if we're contacted by a subdivision owner or if we're contacted by a homeowner in that subdivision who wants their streets maintained by the highway department. We are going to be talking to James or his folks. That subdivision owner or that homeowner may be talking to James and his folks. But the next step in the process, and this is a step that we're ready to do just about at any time, is for us to go out and look at what's there. And we're going to go inspect. We're going to check, just like those pictures showed a few minutes ago, for potholes. We're going to check for stopped up ditches. And when we think about an acceptable level of maintenance, 
that sounds like something that's hard to define. But what we have tried to do consistently across the board with every one of these subdivisions that we look at is we want to be able to add this set of streets to our system in good enough condition that as soon as our sign folks go out there and put the numbers on the posts, we're not getting complaints about poor drainage and potholes. We like to have a little reserve time before we have to start spending money on that set of streets. And that's kind of what we expect to get when we hand a developer or his representative a punch list. And they're pretty comprehensive. Uh, and as you can imagine, the older the subdivision is and the more stuff that's wrong, the bigger the punch list is. And again, when they get that punch list in their hand, we're back to the first thing I said, money. We're back to having to spend money to get us to take it. And it's simple. Either, either the folks asking us to take it on the system are going to have to put that money in it to get us to take it, or we're going to have to put that money in it if we take it. So that's kind of where the contest is. And sometimes we go and everything's rosy and hunky-dory and we issued the punch list and we may not hear from the developer or their representative again for several months. Got some we hadn't heard from in several years. And all of a sudden, we'll get the request again. And we'll go back and do our, our punch list pretty much are good for 60 or 90 days. We don't want anybody trying to hit a moving target. But uh, when we get that request in a few months or a few years, we'll go back and do another punch list. And we'll issue that punch list out to the representative of the subdivision and wait to hear from them again. And we have probably a little over a dozen in that stage of negotiation and uh, we're waiting to hear back from those punch lists. Once the punch list is done, if we're called, and I'll emphasize if we're called, we'll make another visit and if the punch list is satisfied then we will move and we have a petition from the developer and density requirements are met and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of two houses per tenth of a mile. We want the lots to be sold. We want the lots to be owned individually. We don't want to take a subdivision on the system that the developer still owns and is still waiting to sell lots. We want, like I said before, we want that part over. But once all that is satisfied, uh, we'll verify the right of way. We'll go to our right of way department. They'll check off on it. If it's platted as public right away, it's usually just a matter of looking at the plat and saying, yep, they're good to go. Uh, and then we will put a package together that includes a visit to the county commissioners and then a visit to the Board of Transportation, and then it becomes a state road. So making it real short and simple, that's the process. But uh, Gene, is there you, anything we've left out that you want to elaborate on? <laughs> but that's, that's our process, and the dozen or so that we're talking to and in process with uh, have a wide range of dates. Some go real fast, some don't. But uh, with that, if y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to entertain anything you've got. Mr. Jarvis, thank you very much. Anyone have questions of Mr. Jarvis? Lynn, no. got a couple of hands. Yeah, I, you say that they build the roads to minimum standards. Now, if, it, if, a, if a developer comes in and wants to put his subdivision and y'all give them a punch list, 
and say it costs hundred thousand dollars to bring it up. I ain't just just a rough figure. If everybody in that subdivision has to kick in, right? Not as I understand <coughs> it. And and Mr. Hardy, we really do not tell anybody how they to finance those repairs. But That's pretty much left up to the owner of the subdivision or the people that live there. We've seen some variations in any direction, but I, I think in that case, for the most part, it goes back to the county ordinance that says the developer will be responsible for it until it becomes part of the state system. The point I was getting to, if, if everybody had to get in and pay their portion to bring this thing up to standard so you could put it, and you had two hard nosed in the crowd, then you would be at a standstill. You couldn't do anything if they refused, you know, to, be, to put in those here. And nobody, all neighborhoods have that. Is there any other resources they could go to, to outside of paying the money themselves to get it done? So. Well, I, I would, I would, without beating a dead mule, uh, the developer is really the responsible party until it's turned over. But if the developer's not in the equation and the homeowners association or the group of people that live there want it to happen, then it will be pretty much up to them to find a way to overcome the one or two uncooperative neighbors. Uh, it may mean that the two people that refuse ride for free. Yeah, uh, in a lot of cases, it does. That. Yeah. <laughs> uh, legislatively, there has been in the past some legislation that would let the county come in and referee and assess the homeowners back. We've never done that. Uh, you know, and, and, and quite honestly, it would play out just about like you're saying. If you had, if you had 50 homes and you had $50,000 worth of repairs, which is probably a more re realistic figure for a subdivision on most of the checklists that we generate, because we're not looking for grand stuff. I, I don't know of but a few that we would even consider trying to completely have resurfaced. Most of these checklists and punch lists are clean out 50 feet of ditch in three or four places and patch a few potholes and fix a few radiuses. A lot of it is small stuff. Like I say, sometimes there's some major money to be spent, but if you had 50 homes and $50,000, then that would be $1,000 per house. It's conceivable that the county could, by legislation, assess each home $1,000 and decide a pay payment plan that would be suitable. And it, by legislation, only 75% of the road frontage would have to agree to it. So that would overcome the two hard cases, but it would still be some hard territory to go and initiate a new program in. The, the point I was going to try to get to is that you said that they can build at minimum standards. Why don't we raise the standards up so they have to build a butter road and stuff? So that well, I, I think that may road. be that may be a solution, but again, it goes back to that first word I mentioned, and that's money. I, asphalt is is pretty expensive. I've, I've got a question. Man. Part of what you're dealing with is when do you call the ball? It's not your ball. It's the developer's ball until it's your ball. Yes. Your calling the ball is very different than the way the city operates. In yes. The city, a developer puts in a subdivision. It's everything's built according to the plans. Then the, then the city takes it. Doesn't matter if people are living there or not. It's to, a, in my opinion, it's to a developer's advantage to, as soon as you can get it built, get it built right, and turn it over. Yes, sir. You don't want to build it and carry that baby for four, five, six, seven years of maintenance because maybe the sales went slow. Yeah. Why do you wait for sales? What do sales have to do 
With well, it's like, like I said uh, earlier, the worst, absolute worst beating that that minimally constructed road is going to take is when the houses are being built. And it has not been in DOT's best interest and the citizens of North Carolina's best interest to take possession of the subdivision until it's built out. Is that is that policy a DOT statewide type yes, policy? Yes, sir. As far as I know it is. It's the only policy that I have ever been privy to with the highway department and oh. I've been out here about thirty years. So. And comparing it to Greenville, there's a there's a one year maintenance period. So I mean if something major pops up, I'm not talking about a knick knack scratch or something, but that's dealt with. But outside of that, that road is expected to handle that traffic. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've thought about in, in our dealings what the ramifications are if we did take them up front because that certainly would streamline the process and the developer could walk away. But in some parts of eastern North Carolina, we have subdivisions that some of these LLCs have come and put in and had tent sales and flown people over to lots and helicopters and sold 200 lots and left and gone bankrupt and dissolved. And uh, I really would not feel like a good public servant if we, being the highway department, were responsible for maintaining three or four hundred lots in a subdivision that was not being pursued to be built out. But and that could about, happen. Yeah. We hadn't discussed maintaining lots. So that's a whole separate issue. No, no, I'm talking about the streets are built. <coughs> mm -hmm. And we take it as soon as the streets are built without the density requirement. The density requirement really does ensure that we're providing a service to a lot of people instead of just developers. And there's an argument that once you accept it, that uh, somebody's paying property taxes on it. Yeah. Um, Mr. Jarvis, could I, there's 100 counties in North Carolina. The state policy says you have to have a certain density. Um, who sets the minimum standards? That's your standards, right? Those are DOT standards. Okay, that's and DOT some standards. of those standards are <laughs> set from our Board of Transportation, and some of those are set by general statute. But, okay, who determines that once it's built that it is to stand? Does the county do that, or do you go and inspect it at that time, even though it's just a brand-new subdivision? Part of that checklist information that we ask for, um, we get a certification now from the developer or the owner of the subdivision with the engineer of his choosing. Okay. stating and certifying that the road is built to DOT standards, that the stone is there, that the features have been built, the geometry is right, and that the thickness of the asphalt and the actual installation of the asphalt meets our standards. Are you aware of any counties in North Carolina that have a development benefit package um, where they would participate in money along with development or along with time of development uh, to encourage development in that county? I am not, but now I am not an expert on, on what all 100 counties do. I've spent most of my career and most of my work experiences in the eastern part of the state. So the two that you, uh, district engineer, for do not? No, sir. I have a question. I've got a question. <clears throat> if um, <clears throat> some of these subdivisions that we're talking about now, um, if the road is has got potholes, if it's you know if it's got some issues of say a fifty thousand dollars worth of points list items, could could the neighborhood petition and pay DOT to make those repairs, or do they have to get the repairs made themselves? We do not participate in making those repairs just to be sure that we do stay honest and fair with everybody above the radar. And 
it's just something that we have not considered. Now, if we are dealing with a subdivision that is platted and in place before August of 1975, we have a little bit more leeway, but the newer ones we don't. So they would need to find a contractor to, to do it themselves? Yeah. I mean, if, if they... And there, there are a lot of small contractors that could complete most of our punch lists. When you say, said that the neighborhoods have to be <clears throat> built out, is that 100%, 90%, 80%? Gene, have you got the, the, the exact verbiage? Mr. Chairperson, members of the committee, what I'm going to do, Madam, is read you the occupancy requirements out of the North Carolina Subdivision Roads Manual that's available to online. You can get that off our website. What it actually states is there must be at least two <coughs> occupied residents for each one-tenth of a mile. A minimum of four occupied homes is required for the addition of roads less than two-tenths of a mile in length. If four occupied homes are not served, it will be treated as a private drive. An exception may be made if the cul-de-sac is fully developed, serves at least four platted lots, and has four occupied homes that abut the road. A minimum of two homes must have primary access to the cul-de-sacs. As you take in all that, all of it has to come together at one time. And you can't piece one, this one sentence and that one sentence. It all has to work and fit together. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Gene. I have a question. Mr. Jarvis, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't, don't leave. There may be other questions come up if you don't mind, if you we'll stick around for a minute. Thank you. Ms. Harrington, you probably haven't witnessed a lot of the development plans that have come through over the last five or six years that, I mean, routinely the planning board would have five, six, sometimes seven or eight plats come through for review at one time in the preliminary plat stage. And things that Jean just mentioned about cul-de-sacs. Mm -hmm. Our guys with DOT review those preliminary plats before they come to you for recommendation, uh, conditional approval. And if it's a short cul-de-sac bulb, they're going to say the two corner lots have to have access onto the cul-de-sac because there's only two other lots. And if you don't get those four lots having access off the cul-de-sac bulb, it will never be taken over by DOT. So that's some of the review process that goes on behind the scenes. That's why you get, if you had a preliminary plat in front of you, you probably have about 20 conditions attached to it. You'll probably get several conditions from DOT if they're proposed public streets talking about the radii, talking about <clears throat> drainage issues. That's why it's important we get those review comments in, make sure they're met on the construction plan, and then come time for the final plat, we get the certification <coughs> to DOT to ensure that the roads have been built, built to standard. So that process is pretty much in line. That's good. But at some point after that, especially as Woody's mentioned, the economy slowed down. It takes a lot longer for these density requirements to be met. Roads are sitting out there 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And, of course, that time period is going to wear on the improvements, whether it's drainage, whether it's the asphalt or whatever. So, uh, again, I'd like to echo, too, I appreciate um, the assistance from the DOT staff tonight. And uh, they're very diligent in their review when we do get plans through. We haven't seen many of late. But, uh, again, when we do send them down to the Washington office for review, we get the comments back that end up before you. So tonight, as we move forward, um, as I alluded to earlier, 
there are some enforcement issues with our subdivision ordinance. Mr. Jarvis has mentioned we have a pretty good standard in our ordinance, and I will tell you, we had an ordinance committee set up 20 years ago when we completely revamped our ordinance, completely revamped it. And there were existing issues in the standards that were there at that time. And I tell you, we spent an inordinate amount of time on the street maintenance section. Built it up, thought we had everything closed in. Well, in meeting further with our legal staff, there's still a few dangling matters. So after further discussion with them, there are some loopholes that we feel need to be uh, taken care of and specifically being a little bit more explicit about the, the uh, subdivider, subdivider's responsibilities. And um, there are some, we've got a statement within our subdivision ordinance that has to go on the um, face of every final plat. And I'm gonna read that to you real quickly. In our minds, when we drafted this language some 20 years ago, we thought it fit everything. And it basically says, um, under street maintenance disclosure, public streets. And again, the subdivider or developer is required to sign off on this on the plat. Maintenance of public streets shown on this plat is intended to be the responsibility of NCDOT, provided that all the requirements for acceptance are met, what Woody has mentioned. Until such time as NCDOT accepts the streets, I, as the developer, will provide for necessary maintenance. Well, in our ordinance, I mean, in face value, you say that's, that's good enough. Well, our ordinance doesn't spell out what exactly that level of maintenance is. Is it one pothole? We request the developer to go out there and fill it. Do we wait for the third one to appear? Do we wait for a drainage issue? The enforcement is not um, spelled out fairly well to us. So. And what is even more problematic when it's an issue that our county legal staff have to defend uh, is again apparent that we need additional language added. Also, there's no standard level of acceptance, acceptable maintenance and or specific enforcement process that's been identified. So we'd like to have more guidance along those lines. As we've worked on certain cases, and most of you are aware, there are some uh, development sites, subdiv uh, subdivisions out in our jurisdiction now where some of the developers have gone bankrupt. Some of them are now deceased. There's a whole different set of circumstances for any given one. And as we move further into a legal process, we're seeing that a lot of times the county may not have standing as we see it. So we feel like additional information needs to be added once again. And again, as I mentioned, each case, different situation, different process, uh, we just, any case that comes up that we get landowners, some of the homeowners involved in, there's always, you know, a set of circumstances that it's a different flavor than anything we've touched on before. So possible solutions, number one, and we really like to move forward on this as, as fast as possible, amend the subdivision ordinance to include um, explicit language regarding the subdivision's main, subdivider's maintenance responsibility, the standard level of acceptable maintenance, and include an enforcement process. Again, being very specific as to what the developer has to do during that interim process. Further down the line, we'd also like to investigate, Frank's mentioned, uh, maintenance guarantees. There are just a few counties that we're aware of that require these. And some of the stipulations that we'd have to investigate is, uh, number one, what is the formula that we would use if someone brought in a new subdivision that, let's say, has a half a mile of proposed public streets? How much money should we require? It's got to last, it could be five years, 10 years, 15 years. So again, inflation process, inflation has to be calculated in. So that's some of the information we feel like we need to further investigate. And uh, also, Woody's alluded to, legislation that's now available. Uh, really sets up a service district of sorts within a subdivision 
for those homeowners that uh, actually have access onto the state ma or onto the proposed public road that they'd like to have taken over for DOT maintenance. There's a process we'd have to go through. We mentioned at least 75% of those homeowners have to agree to that. So number one is the county, specifically the Board of Commissioners, interested in getting involved in that process. There's been some discussion with the board about it. At this point, we've not had a formal request to move forward. As Woody said, he's not seen one in his district. We've not had one float out from Pitt County here. So um, that's something else that we'd like to investigate a little bit further, of course, with our legal staff's uh, assistance. So, Mr. Chairman, our next steps, what we're proposing tonight with your consensus is to draft amendment language for the subdivision to address some of those issues I've discussed. Uh, then, secondarily, compile additional information about the maintenance guarantees and the special assessments, and also would like to receive input from the board tonight about any other stakeholders, similar to what we had with the DOT coming in tonight. Would you like to hear from some developers, some homeowners, someone from the Institute of Government or School of Government, and have them bring additional information back? As we compile information about maintenance guarantees and all, we may bring forward additional guests that we'd like to bring forward to you to discuss their uh, processes. So, Mr. Chairman, welcome any guidance, any comments here. And again, we did, were seeking consensus tonight at least to move forward with the amendment language and get that back to you at your next meeting. Thank you, James. Comments from the board. Well, it's not, it's not too early to start on it. We need to get, get right on it. And I, I would uh, recommend and would motion that uh, we follow his guidelines, his recommendations and to bring in some other stakeholders so we can hear the other side of the story, too. I'll second. I have a motion. Second. That was, it. Was, it was his motion. Okay. I have a motion and a second that we adopt the recommendations and instruct staff to move forward. Love a discussion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, James. James. Mr. Jarvis, thank you all for coming. Appreciate <clears throat> it. Thank you for everything you're doing to serve North Carolina. Appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. I'm having to flip through all the exhibits here. Um, the next item is a proposed amendment to the <clears throat> zoning ordinance regarding, oh, one of my favorite subjects, eating food. <laughs> <laughs> That's mine too, as you can, as you can probably tell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do just have a quick amendment uh, that we'd like to propose for you tonight. Um, we are proposing an amendment to the zoning ordinance to allow outdoor fruit and vegetable markets. Otherwise, otherwise what do we call it? Farmers markets uh, within the R40 low density residential zoning district. And as you recall, uh, over the last year and a half, two years, we, we worked on an um, update to our comprehensive land use plan. And one of these goals that we've implemented for uh, particularly to improve community health uh, is to improve access to healthy foods. And this is by promoting the production of, access to, and consumption of locally produced foods. And we have been approached by somebody that's interested in, in starting a farmer's market in the R40 district. Um, We've also spoken with uh, several members of the health department uh, that have, have been instrumental in partnering with us with the uh, CPBW initiative uh, over the last couple years. And uh, it's a, we feel like this is going to help accomplish uh, at least part of this goal uh, to increase access to healthy fruits and vegetables uh, within these areas of the county. Uh, so uh, quite simply, the, the amendment is to um, add the uh, the Z under the R40 district in our permitted use table. This will make these uh, markets a permitted use in the R40 district. And again, uh, this helps accomplish our goal of, of uh, increasing access to uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the project schedule, uh, presenting the draft amendments to the board tonight, again, it's just, it's just the one small amendment to the permitted use table. We're not making any changes to definitions or any kind of other standards. Uh, they'll be permitted by right. 
also subject to uh, the, the parking or, or screening requirements as needed or as necessary in the ordinance. Uh, October 15th, we'll be holding the Board of County Commissioners public hearing and proposing this to become effective immediately uh, upon their hopeful adoption of the uh, request. Uh, so we do recommend approval of the amendment and ask that the board forward a recommendation of approval to the county commissioners. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Where any did, questions? Yeah. Where, where did you say this farm was marked? Uh, it's, it's a proposed to be opened up in the R40 district uh, around the Rock Springs area. Okay. <clears throat> I'll, I'll entertain a motion that we accept the plan board's uh, recommendation to change the order. Right. We have a motion Just to second. accept the second. recommendation from staff. So second. I have a second. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the recommendation say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. <clears throat> James? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, moving on into the informational items, um, this starts on page 18 of your agenda package. Uh, we do have three members that this may well be their last night here with us after serving two full terms, that being six years long. So with that, as you see on the screen, we've got three, Lynn Evans, that's been our at-large member, uh, Taylor Keith, District B representative, and Porter Stokes, District 5. And we have proceeded on with our request to the clerk to the board to have the Board of Commissioners consider uh, replacement members for those three, as well as we have two members that are up for reappointment, having only served either a partial term or one full term. And both Thomas Harris and Clay Malloy have requested uh, reappointment. So we'll know more about that as well once the commissioners uh, meet in October. So remember, our year starts in October. So when we get back for our next meeting, more than likely you'll have some new members and you'll also be electing new officers. So keep that in mind. And with that tonight, I think the chairman has a few certificates to hand out for those uh, individuals that will be leaving us. Okay. James, you want me to do it up front? Yes, sir. First of all, let me say that uh, for a as a member of the planning board, the public needs to appreciate all of the work that we do and appreciate the staff. We do this on behalf of the citizens of Pitt County. And tonight, as James has already said, we have two that have finished their first terms, Clay Malloy and Thomas Harris, and uh, they have shown interest to continue to serve the public. And with the wishes of the county, maybe they'll be back with us next month. But uh, at this time, I would like to ask uh, Keith Taylor Lynn Evans and Porter Stokes to come forward. Come on up. <laughs> well, it'll be in the order that I have the certificates. These three gentlemen have served Pitt County very, very well for six years. We could spend a lot of time listening to the stories that they've had over the last six years, but we won't do that. But thank you on behalf of uh, Pitt County. Two of them, Porter and Taylor, have been chairman of this board, and they served very, very well. And Lynn has brought many years of experience to this board. Thank you for that. So <clears throat> we have certificates. And the first one I have here is Porter Stokes, who's soon to be a grandfather. Uh -oh. <laughs> Porter, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And Taylor Keith, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Taylor. And Lynn, thank you very, thank you, very much. All right, thank you. And uh, the policy of this 
county is after a year's absence, you can reapply. So seriously think about that. Thank you very much. Let's give them a standing. And again, even before a year expires, we do have vacancies now on our Board of Adjustment coming up. You have been uh, sitting through a lot of these meetings. You have a lot of information about our zoning ordinance and other uh, development requirements. Put that to good use. Uh, get your application back in, and we will certainly entertain that uh, as we move forward. Their year starts on the calendar year, so you've got a month or two to get your application of interest in and we will make sure that uh, that gets to the clerk to the board for consideration so again thanks for your service um, just a few other updates uh, you may recall the city of Greenville's ETJ extension that was out near the frog level area that was considered by the commissioners in August their August 20 August 20th meeting and that was approved still a process by which the city has to go through to meet statutory requirements so that is not official yet the parcel is still within the county's jurisdiction until that process is completed comprehensive uh, land use plan implementation priorities as you recommended the board of commissioners approved that was approved also on august the 20th and we are actively going about getting those uh, priorities implemented so we'll be bringing back annual updates as to where we are in those process in that process the other thing i want to make you aware of um i think we provided a little bit of information about this um also at the august 20th commissioner meeting the board uh, approved the ordinance for voluntary agricultural districts here in the county and again strictly voluntary any farmer that uh, meets certain criteria and applies uh, makes application to a committee or a board that's yet to be uh, established can have one of these signs posted around their property and uh, it would indicate of course that there are certain farming operations that may smell may have dust uh, may have noise associated with agricultural activities so again it's an awareness campaign of sorts to let folks know number one the county is actively acknowledging the importance of agriculture in the community and also letting individual citizens know there's an agricultural operation nearby so get your application for interest in if you're interested in this um, board as well because there will be representatives especially anybody that's in the farming uh, uh, affiliated with farming can serve on this particular committee and that will actually take effect in March of 2013 and uh, Brian Evans with our soil and water board will be the staff uh, person responsible for administering this also if you've been out of County Home Road lately uh, around the senior center or the community schools and recreation district park all those other activities out there wintergreen school animal shelter recycling center village of yesteryear we now have a crosswalk that can get you from one side more safely from one side of the county home road to the opposite um, this was recently installed right before school started back in august and it does as you can see within the turn lane there there are now concrete medians with some signage and appropriate striping across county home road to get people more safely across um, from one side of the road to the other uh, also connector trails have gone in you can see where they tie in on the sidelines and there's actually a connector trail that runs up to the farmers market now as well and also ties into uh, the wintergreen school and other areas around there uh, very nice facility if you haven't been out there of late you need to try out the farmers market go over to the district park take a walk around the trails it's a lot cooler than it has been so uh, if you get a chance try that out that is also partially funded through our communities putting prevention to work grant as well as 
a Violet Foundation grant, and a host of other grant funders from around the community. So uh, very limited county funds right now, so we're seeking funds from other sources. Other things, uh, there was another mining operation, a conditional use permit that was um, approved by the board at its last meeting earlier this month, uh, the Board of Commissioners, and also included in your package are our monthly reports from July and August. So, Mr. Chairman, that's all we have for you tonight, and we will bring back to you at your next meeting um, more information about the street maintenance issues. James, thank you. Any comments from the board? I hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Sounds unanimous. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a good month. Mm.